begin with a mystery that has raised eyebrows for decades, but today has been proven to be a rather common item. The story of the Costco artifact has been embellished over the years, but all accounts have common elements. On February 13, 1961, Wallace Lane, Virginia Maxey, and Mike Mikesell were seeking interesting mineral specimens, particularly geodes, for their LMNV Rockhounds Gem and Gift Shop in California. The trio were about six miles northeast of Alancha, near the top of a peak about 4,300 feet in elevation and about 340 feet above the dry bed of Owens Lake. At lunchtime, after collecting rocks most of the morning, all three placed their specimens in the rock sack Mike Sell was carrying. The next day in the gift shop's workroom, Mike Sell ruined a nearly new diamond saw blade while cutting what he thought was a geode. Inside the nodule that was cut, Mike Sell did not find a cavity as so many geodes have, but a perfectly circular section of very hard white material that appeared to be porcelain. In the center of the porcelain cylinder was a two millimeter shaft of bright metal. The metal shaft responded to a magnet. There were still other odd quantities about the specimen. The outer layer of the specimen was allegedly encrusted with fossil shells and their fragments. In addition to shells, there were reports of two metallic metal objects in the crust resembling a nail and a washer. Stranger still, the inner layer was hexonal and seemed to form a casing around the hard porcelain cylinder. Within the inner layer, a layer of decomposing copper allegedly surrounded the porcelain cylinder. The group had an anomaly. Here was a possible geode over 500,000 years old with some sort of electronic device buried within it. The object looked like a spark plug and no one could figure out how it came to be encased in a geode from thousands of years ago. A spark plug encased in 500,000 year old geode would represent a substantial scientific and historical anomaly as spark plugs were invented in the 19th century. Critics say that the stone matrix containing the artifact is not a geode but consecration that can be explained by natural processes that can take place over a decade or two. Had the group really found a piece of technology encased in a prehistoric stone from ages ago? In 2018, an investigation by Paris Stromberg and Paul Hendrich, with the help of members of the Spark Plug Collectors of America, identified the artifact as a 1920s era champion spark plug, widely used in the Ford Model T and Model A engines. SPCA President Chad Wyndham and other collectors concurred with his assessment. Stromberg and Hendrich's report indicates that the spark plug became encased in a concretion composed of iron derived from the rusting spark plug. Iron and steel artifacts rapidly form iron oxide concretions as they rust in the ground. On April 12, 2018, Paris Stromberg was contacted by the family of one of the co-discoverers of the artifact. He was offered an opportunity to physically inspect the artifact, and he accepted, and also arranged for the artifact to be inspected by a geologist from the University of Washington Earth and Space Science Department. The inspections confirmed the previous conclusion that the artifact was a 1920s era champion spark plug. The Caso artifact is a good example of not jumping to conclusions when analyzing ancient artifacts. There could be a simple and reasonable explanation. However, some artifacts are not simple to explain and seemingly have no reasonable explanations. The schist disk is one of those unusual artifacts that defies explanation. It's been thought to be anything from an elaborate candle or incense holder to an impeller from some technological device. 
In January 1936, a strange disk was unearthed at the plateau edge of North Saqqara, approximately 1.7 kilometers north of Djoser's Steppe Pyramid in Egypt. The discovery of the mysterious prehistoric artifact that many considered as a device was made in the tomb of Prince Sebu around 3100 BC by a famous British Egyptologist, Walter Byron Emery. Sabu was the son of a high official or administrator of a town or province probably called Star of the Family of Horus. The unearthed device, named the Schist Disc, is approximately 24 inches by 4.2 inches in the center. It was manufactured by unknown means, from very fragile and delicate material requiring very tedious carving the production of which would confound any craftsman today. Now many important questions arise. Scientists do not think the object is a wheel because the wheel appeared in Egypt at 1500 BC during the 18th dynasty. If the schist disc is in fact a wheel, it would mean ancient Egyptians possessed knowledge of the wheel about 3000 BC during the time of the first dynasty this would require Egyptologists to rewrite some history books. If the schist disc is not a wheel, nor modeled after the wheel, what is it? Some scientists suggest that the fragile nature of such an intricately carved stone object greatly limits its practical usage and suggests a purely ornamental function, being of a religious or some other ritualistic purpose. Of course, some believe this disc served another purpose, as a lamp. However, critics of the theory argue that the three-blade ceremonial lamp is hardly possible because of the shape and curvature of its petals, which seems to suggest a function, not just decoration. Egyptologist Cyril Aldrin reached the conclusion that, independently of what the object was used for or what it represented, its design was without a doubt a copy of a previous, more older, metallic object. Why did the ancient Egyptians bother to design an object with such a complex structure more than 5,000 years ago? How could a culture who typically used chisels to shape rock have mastered a technique to work such a delicate material into this extraordinary level? Obviously, the schist disc is an object that played an important role 5,000 years ago. Egyptologists offer a number of theories trying to explain what the disc was used for, but for the moment, no one has been able to explain the object's complex structure. The schist disc's futuristic design continues to baffle all those who have seen it. There is no doubt this particular object continues to constitute one of the most perplexing Egyptian and ancient mysteries, and we are left with several unanswered questions. You can examine the schist disc yourself, as it is currently in the Cairo Museum. In 1944, as a 10-year-old boy, Newton Anderson was fueling the coal furnace in his parents' home. He dropped a lump of coal onto the basement floor and it broke in half, revealing that it contained a bell inside. The coal that was mined near his house in Upshur County, West Virginia, is about 300 million years old. What is a brass bell with an iron clapper doing in coal ascribed to the Carboniferous period. According to Norm Chomborough's book Ammunition, which includes several coal antidotes, the bell is an antediluvian artifact made before the Genesis flood. The Institute of Creation Research had the bell submitted to the lab at the University of Oklahoma. There, a nuclear activation analysis revealed that the bell contains an unusual mix of metals, different from any known modern alloy production, including copper, zinc, 
tin, arsenic, iodine, and selenium. There is a winged statue at the top of the bell which does not resemble any known cultural depiction. The closest depictions with similarities would be the Babylonian southwest wind demon called Pazuzu. There is a headpiece missing on the bell which may have indicated the bell statue was taller. This is not the only artifact found in coal millions of years old. An iron pot was found in coal in Oklahoma. In a notarized statement, Frank Kennard said in 1948 he was working in the municipal electric plant in Thomas, Oklahoma in 1912. He came upon a solid chunk of coal which was too large to use. He broke it up with a sledgehammer. The iron pot fell from the center, leaving the impression or mold of the pot in a piece of the coal. Jim Stahl, an employee of the company, witnessed the breaking of the coal and saw the pot fall out. He traced the source of the coal and found that it came from Will Burton, Oklahoma mines. A handful of other such artifact and coal accounts have been recorded by Ivan T. Sanderson, including an intricate gold chain found in coal. The Morrisonville, Illinois Times on June 11, 1891, published a report that Miss S.W. Culp found a circular-shaped 8-carat gold chain about 10 inches long embedded in a lump of coal after she broke it apart to put it in her scuttle. The chain was described as antique and of quaint workmanship. The story said only part of the chain was revealed when she first broke open the coal and that the rest of the chain remained buried within the coal. The coal came from one of the southern Illinois mines. Unfortunately, the artifact has since disappeared. Objects that are millions of years old can only mean there was a civilization predating our modern culture. Who made these items eons ago? This question will probably never be answered. Suppose you came across a Roman dodecahedron. Would you know what it is or what it was used for? This artifact is a small hollow object made of bronze or stone with a dodecahedron shape. Twelve flat pentagonal faces, each face having a circular hole of varying diameter in the middle, the holes connected to the hollow center. Roman dodecahedra date from the 2nd or 3rd centuries AD. About a hundred of these objects have been found from Wales to Hungary and Spain and to the east of Italy and most found in Germany and France. Ranging from 4 to 11 centimeters in size, they also vary in terms of textures. Most are made of bronze, but some are made of stone. No mention of them has been found in contemporary accounts or pictures of the time. Speculated uses include a candlestick, because wax has been found inside two examples, dice, survey instruments for estimating distances to or distances of objects, devices for determining the optimal sow date for winter grain, gauges to calibrate water pipes or army standard bases. Use as a measuring instrument of any kind seems improbable since the artifacts are not standardized and come in many sizes and arrangements of their openings. It has also been suggested that they may have been religious artifacts or even fortune-telling devices. This latter speculation is based on the fact that most of the examples have been found in Gallo-Roman sites. Several diodicahedra were found in coin boards providing evidence that the owners considered them valuable objects. Smaller diodicandra with the same features, holes and knobs, and made from gold have been found in Southeast Asia. Speculation among historians has resulted in many different hypotheses, which is as close as we may get to an accurate answer. 
Few archaeologists will even comment on it because these objects aren't defined to a specific cultural area and therefore not their area of expertise. Even the theories that do exist are highly debated among historians. Can you figure out what this artifact is or its purpose? If you can, then you may solve one of the most perplexing mysteries of our time. Tiny objects are one thing to ponder over, but what do you do when confronted with huge puzzle pieces that fit together so perfectly you cannot get a sheet of rice paper between them? Throughout the world, there are large boulder-like stones fitted together so perfectly no one has any idea how they were quarried and placed together. People are very creative and artistic. But to quarry a stone over 500 tons, move it, and put it into place where it fits perfectly behooves even the most intelligent architect of today. Yet these walls exist all over the world, and no one knows how they were made or placed together. For example, consider the walls in Peru, Baalbek, and other ancient sites around the globe. Theories range from ancient giants that placed the stones, to aliens with anti-gravity, magical talents some men had, to simple levers. Some believe the only way to get this precision would be to melt the stones into place. Today's builders and stone masons would have a hard time duplicating these artifacts, even with modern tools and technology. Some say it simply cannot be done. Who built these walls and how? The Antikytherian mechanism is generally referred to as the first known analog computer. The quality and complexity of the mechanism's manufacture suggests that it has undiscovered predecessors made during the Hellenistic period. Its construction relies on theories of astronomy and mathematics developed by Greek astronomers during the second century BC and it's estimated to have been built in the late 2nd century BC or the early 1st century BC. It is the world's first known computer. A computer from the 2nd century? Perhaps, but some believe it may be much older. It was found in a shipwreck in 1900 along with statues and pottery but no one knows if it is an older item that was along with the Greek pottery, or if it may be much older and was being transported with current items of the time. Scientists believe it was used to plot the movement of the sun, moon, and stars. Thus, it was a clock of sorts that could accurately predict upcoming astrological events and tell time. Some pieces of the clock have never been found, and it's possible there are more components of it buried in the shipwreck and lost forever. The scientists who have reconstructed the Antikytherian mechanism also agree that it was too sophisticated to have been a unique device, that there must be others. Of special delight to physicists, the moon mechanism uses a special train of bronze gears, two of them linked with a slightly offset axis to indicate the position and phase of the moon. As is known today from Kepler's law of planetary motion, the moon travels at different speeds as it orbits the earth, and this speed differential is modeled by the Antikytherian mechanism. 
even though the ancient Greeks were not aware of the actual elliptical shape of the orbit of the moon. If ancient computers existed 500 BC, could other advanced technologies have existed in the ancient past? What if a modern jet plane were found in an ancient pyramid? It would of course be a major discovery. And it may have already happened. Is this a helicopter? Is this a spaceship? A submarine or modern boat? The 3,000 year old hieroglyphs found in Satil's temple in Abydos, Egypt are said to depict nothing less than a helicopter. Plane and futuristic aircraft among the usual insects, symbols, and snakes. The writings have become known as the helicopter hieroglyphics among pseudoscience and conspiracy circles, with many supporters of the theory saying that if the ancient civilization was putting helicopters and modern spacecraft in their artwork, then they must have seen them, or at least pictures of them. And for that to have happened, someone from the future must have taken them back. Some have even taken the theory a step further, introducing aliens to the equation. The question remains, why would ancient Egyptians depict a modern helicopter above a doorway in a tomb? If it's not a helicopter, then what is it? Why is it there alongside of what appears to be a modern boat or submarine and a science fiction style spaceship? What did the Egyptians know 3,000 years ago? And if they knew about helicopters, what else could be hiding in undiscovered tombs across the African continent? Dropa stones are said by some ufologists and pseudo-archaeologists to be a series of at least 716 circular stone disks dating back 12,000 years, on which tiny hieroglyphic-like markings may be found. Each disk is claimed to measure up to one foot in diameter and carry two grooves, originating from a hole in their center, in the form of a double spiral. The hieroglyphic-like markings are said to be found in these grooves. No record has been found of the stones being displayed in any of the world's museums, and their current whereabouts are unknown. In 1962, a Chinese researcher, Sung Um Nui, was reported to have concluded that the grooves on the discs were actually very tiny hieroglyphs none of which were a pattern that had been seen before and which can only be seen with the use of a magnifying glass. He announced that he had deciphered them into a story that told of a spacecraft that crashed landed in the area of the cave, the Bayan Har Mountains, and that the ship contained the Dropa people who could not fit in and therefore had to adapt to Earth. Further, his research claims that the Dropa people were hunted down and killed by the local Han Chinese for a period. Sum Um Nui noted specifically that one glyph apparently said, the Dropa came down from the clouds in their aircraft. Our men, women, and children hid in the caves 10 times before sunrise. When at last we understood the sign language of the Dropas, we realized that the newcomers had peaceful intentions. Sum Um Nui is said to have published his findings in 1962 in a professional journal and was subsequently ridiculed and met with disbelief. Shortly afterwards, he's said to have gone to Japan in a self-imposed exile where he died not long after he completed the manuscript of his work. The stones themselves seem to have disappeared. 
The stone discs were supposedly stored in various museums across China. However, none of these museums have any records or traces of Dropa stones ever being there. They obviously existed because there are photographs of them. What are these stone discs and where did they come from? Is the story they tell true and if so, is there any proof other than the stones? The mysterious discovery was allegedly made in 1930 when Chi Pu Ti, an archaeology professor at Peking University, and his students were on an expedition to explore a series of caves in the inaccessible mountains near Tibet, which were supposedly carved artificially in a system of underground tunnels and pantries. Now, according to these events, it said that Professor Chu Piti and his students found tombs with skeletons of four to six feet in height buried inside them. The skeletons had abnormally large heads and small, thin, and fragile bodies. In addition to the skeletal remains, Professor Chu Piti and his students discovered countless other items. After the studies on the Dropa stones, researchers turned their attention to the people in the area themselves. What happened to the Dropa? The cave area where the stones were located still had two tribes living in the vicinity, the Dropas and the Kams. Archaeologists were called in to determine where the two tribes originated from, but were unable to relate either tribe to a known race. They also noticed that the people in these tribes had a very short average height and abnormally large heads and eye sockets. They were extremely thin characters with a very obvious yellow tinge to their skin color. Could these be the direct ancestors to the Dropa? Have you ever seen a Waffle Rock? There is one in Virginia and it's on display. Waffle Rock in America is a real geology puzzle because of the amazing patterns formed on its surface. Called Waffle Rock because it looks like a waffle iron grid, the question is how was it made? Is it natural or the imprint of some advanced technological device that has long ago eroded and left its emboss on this natural rock? The Army Corps of Engineers and geologists say it's a natural formation, period. End of story. Nothing to see here. However, the scientific explanations don't account for all the features present in the rock. Aside from the unusual ancient alien talk, many believe that the pattern is actually an early form of hieroglyphic or primitive writing, and that the rock is the result of Neolithic art by pre-Columbian peoples. The rock, on display at the West Virginia Outlook on Jennings Randolph Lake, is but a small piece of the original rock. It was moved there to save the geologically significant piece of history from a dam project, likely in no small part because of pressure exerted by the original residents of Shaw, a town removed for the dam. Photographs of the whole rock show clearly the pattern or the structure of the pattern does not run all the way through the rock, but rather can only be seen on one side. Most agree the rock is at least 250 million years old. It's either a perfectly natural formation, or the work of an old ancient civilization, or maybe even aliens. Today, you can find just about any place with a quick Google search. But in times past, to get from here to there, you needed a map. 
maps have been used to chart every point known around the globe. The more accurate, the better the map. And when trusting your life to the sea, you wanted the best map you could get. So when you went there, you didn't end up somewhere else. In 1513, a trip to the New World was all the rage, and accurate maps were needed to get to this newly founded land. Enter Peri Rhesus, a cartographer. Peri Rhesus served in the Turkish Navy, for which he held the rank of Admiral. He used 20 different maps and charts as his source documents to create what today is called the Peri Rhesus map. Eight of them were polemic maps, maps of the known world according to the second century Hellenistic or Greek society. Four were Portuguese maps, one was an Arabic map, and one was drawn by Christopher Columbus himself. It was considered a very accurate map. But here is where the map gets weird. Along with depicting Africa, South America, and various islands accurately, it appears to show Antarctica with no ice caps. Antarctica as it would have looked over 6,000 years ago. Antarctica has been covered with ice for over 6,000 years and no one has sailed around the planet before it froze over. So how could a map referenced from older maps have depicted the continent so accurately? Modern satellite mapping, which can peer through the ice, confirms the map is accurate. It correctly shows the outline of Antarctica as it is under the ice. Peri had referenced a map that displayed Antarctica correctly. So where did that map come from? Who would have known in 1513 that Antarctica is a continent and not just a huge landscape of ice? Who could have mapped it over 6,000 years ago when no one could see it and tell it was a continent? No one knows. It's a huge mystery. And now you have a new map to ponder over. If you take a tube of copper, a rod of iron, and put them in a clay pot filled with juice or some acidic liquid, do you know what you get? A battery, that's what. Kind of like the potato clock novelty science toys you can buy, the clay pot battery will actually work. Man has known about electricity since old Ben Franklin flew a kite in a storm, or so we are told. What if batteries were around centuries ago? Well, apparently, they were, or so it seems. The Baghdad Battery is a set of three artifacts which were found together, a ceramic pot, a tube of copper, and a rod of iron. It was discovered in modern Iraq, close to the capital of the Parthian Empire from around 250 BC, and is considered to date from that period. Its origin and purpose remain unclear, and further evidence is needed to explain its purpose. It was hypothesized by some researchers that the object functioned as a galvanic cell or battery, possibly used for electroplating or some kind of electrotherapy. But there is no electro-gilded objects known from this period. An alternative explanation is that it functioned as a storage vessel for sacred scrolls. The battery has been proven to work, and on the modern program Mythbusters, several were linked together to produce 4 volts, enough to barely electroplate with. Some researchers believe 4 volts is not enough to be useful for electroplating, but it could have been used for some kind of mild electrotherapy, such as pain relief, possibly through electroacupuncture. What it was used for is the mystery. That it was real and did exist is not a question. An over 2,000 year old battery makes you wonder if it keeps going and going and going and going and going.
Finding odd combinations of things is the norm in archaeology. It wouldn't be too uncommon to find an old hammer with its handle still intact. But what if you found a hammer encased in rock over 100 million years old? In the 1930s in the city of London near Red Creek, Texas, an iron hammer was discovered embedded in a rock. How did it get there? The hammer had to have been built before the rock was formed, hundreds of millions of years ago. According to analysis, the rock enveloping the tool was dated to the Ordovician era, more than 400 million years old, while the hammer itself is thought to be much older, dating back 500 million years. The wooden handle of the hammer is so old that it has begun to turn into coal. That's one very old tool. It was determined that the hammer's head is made of 97% pure iron, 2% chlorine, and 1% sulfur. In the 80 or so years since the hammer was unearthed, the metal object has not shown any signs of rust, making it a unique blend of metallurgy that some claim to be a lost technology from an ancient civilization. Both researchers and historians are divided into two camps in respect to the finding, with one arguing that the artifact is proof prehistoric cultures existed long before what history books tell us, and the other is denying that possibility. Could this strange object be evidence of a civilization predating what is known in our modern understanding of history? Who made the hammer? And who used it? 500 million years ago. That is some serious hammer time. It seems every day science is pushing back the date man became an intellectual being. Gobeki Tepe sits in a plateau in Turkey and is around 20,000 years old. 20,000 years ago, man is supposed to be eking out a living with sticks and clubs, yet here is a complex arrangement of statues, some many tons in weight, with carvings of animals and other symbols. Gobeki Tepe includes two phases of use believed to be a social or ritual nature dating back to the 10th millennium BC, during the first phase belonging to the pre-pottery Neolithic circles. A massive T-shaped stone pillars were erected, the world's oldest known megaliths. More than 200 pillars in about 20 circles are currently known through geophysical surveys. Each pillar has a height of up to 20 feet and weighs up to 10 tons. They're fitted into sockets that were hewn out of the bedrock. In the second phase belonging to the pre-pottery Neolithic, the erected pillars are smaller and stood in rectangular rooms with floors of polished lime. Pretty sophisticated for cavemen, right? The details of the structure's function remain a mystery. It was excavated by a German archaeologist under the direction of Klaus Schmidt from 1996 until his death in 2014. Schmidt believed that the site was a sanctuary where people from a wide region periodically congregated, not a settlement. The structures not only predate pottery, metallurgy, and the invention of writing or the will, but they were built before the so-called Neolithic Revolution that marks the beginning of agriculture and animal husbandry around 9000 BC. The construction of Gobeki Tepli implies organization of an advanced order not associated with Paleolithic societies. However, archaeologists estimate that up to 500 persons were required to exact the heavy pillars from local quarries and move them 330 to 1,640 feet to the site. 
The pillars weigh 10 to 20 metric tons, with one still in the quarry weighing 50 tons. The site continues to perplex scientists and raise more questions than it answers. It's the oldest monolithic site on the planet as of today, predating everything else. It absolutely could not have been built and crafted by Neolithic man. Giant walls are built to keep people out, or keep people in. They are barriers, usually built for political reasons to hold off an invading army or a group of unwanted people. In some cases, they may be used to house people or protect animals. In any case, a wall is something of a huge discovery in archaeology. If you ever find yourself driving through Rockwall, Texas, you may ask yourself, why this suburb of Dallas is called Rockwall. Well, there is an ancient wall there. You can't see it because it's buried, but it's there. For over 160 years, scientists have claimed the wall is nothing more than a natural formation. Most people living in Rockwall, Texas do not even know that their city is named after an ancient rock wall city complete with a skull of a giant that was found while some people were digging a well looking for water a long time ago. The wall is an almost perfect rectangle, four miles wide and seven miles, encompassing more than 20 square miles long, with most of the wall being buried. The top of the wall at all outcroppings found to date have a uniform elevation of 550 feet above mean sea level. Mary Patty Wade Gibson is the granddaughter of T.U. Wade, founder of the wall at the Rockwall County Historical Foundation. She described the additional digging her grandfather and other men did at the home site. In her description were cubicles or rooms constructed of stone which you could walk through and would reach a corridor which seemed to run in a direction into the hill that the town square sits upon. She told of an incident in 1906 of two unidentified men digging out the corridor which had apparently been filled with erosion. Their intent was to reach a room or cavity under the town which might be full of gold apparently derived from a story from Indian legend. The ceiling of the corridor had steep slopes, describing a Gothic-type arched ceiling, much like the Mayans built, and the further into the corridor the two men excavated, the steeper the slope of the ceiling became. Consequently, the men, fearful of a structural failure, abandoned their search for gold. Mary Patty Gibson also says that during her grandfather's exploration of the wall, he discovered on the outside the wall went straight down. On the inside, she described the wall going down to about 40 feet, curves inward, and becomes much thicker. Additional information provided by the daughter of the late Mr. Dewees, an early settler of Rockwall, who described a doorway with a diagonal shaped stone in the wall at the Wade residence on Highway 66. This portion of the wall was open to visitors from 1936 until the late 1940s and was consequently backfilled because of dangerous structural conditions. In 1949, a Mr. Sanders of Fort Worth, Texas, did an excavation of the wall. From this excavation, four large stones were brought up with the largest weighing approximately two tons. On these stones were found inscriptions with what appear to be pictographs. The Dallas Morning News on the 5th of November 1967 reported that back in the 1920s, T.H. Meredith said a well was dug on his farm just east of the town of Rockwall, and Mr. Meredith declared that the digging went alongside a masonry wall which seemed to have an arch over a doorway or window. 
metal rings were found at the site, which was composed of tin, titanium, and iron embedded in the rock. You can see it in this photo just above the pickaxe. Of course, all this material and the skull have been lost, and much of the wall today cannot be seen. It's also unlikely any modern excavations will happen because the town has grown and is now an urban section next to Dallas. But if you drive through Rockwall, Texas, you can think about what mysteries may lie just a few feet below your car. Giant skulls. Really? What's up with that? The truth is, giant skulls are very real and have been found worldwide. First, let me warn you that there are a bunch of fake giant skull photos floating around the internet. So if you see one, do your own research and determine if it is real or fake. You see, there was a contest not long ago to make giant skull images in Photoshop and all of those contest entries are out there now being mixed up with the real ones. So let's take a look at the reality versus the misinformation. Your first question may be, why is it so hard to find real giant skull photos? Well, the reason is simple. Under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, a federal law was passed in 1990 requiring Native American artifacts and remains to be handed over to culturally affiliated tribes or provable descendants and then reburied. The few skulls that remain in anthropological facilities cannot be photographed under this law. So all photos of the existence of giant skulls were taken before 1990. The other issue is that because giants didn't fit the religious criteria of early explorers and researchers, they were often dismissed or even destroyed. Many were sent to the Smithsonian and subsequently destroyed by the curator who back in the early 1930s thought it was against his beliefs and didn't fit his personal anthropology theories. So, let's take a look at some real giant skulls. These are not isolated accounts. There are literally 
hundreds of reports around the turn of the century describing large bones and skulls, many from accredited newspapers and doctors. So why the mystery? Well, even today many scientists refuse to look at the evidence because they would have to rewrite the history books and include a giant civilization in North America, which apparently was here long before the Native Americans and existed up to colonization. Skulls and bones found around the world corroborate this. With the lack of physical evidence and the mysteries surrounding many of these finds, science just can't be bothered to take a serious look at the obvious. Our only hope is that sometime in the near future, someone somewhere digs up a new find and is wise enough to photograph and document it before it can be taken away. In a mysterious pyramid in China's Qinghai Providence near Mount Baigong are three caves filled with pipes leading to a nearby saltwater lake. There are also pipes under the lake bed and on the shore. The iron pipes range in size from some smaller than a toothpick. The strangest part is that they may be 150,000 years old. Dating done by the Beijing Institute of Geology determined these iron pipes were smelted about 150,000 years ago, if they were indeed made by humans, according to Brian Dunning of Skeptoid.com. And if they were made by humans, history, as it is commonly viewed, would have to be reevaluated. The dating was done using thermoluminescence a technique that determines how long ago crystalline mineral was exposed to sunlight or heated. Humans are only thought to have inhabited the region for the past 30,000 years. Even with the known history of the area, the only humans to inhabit the region were nomads, whose lifestyle would not leave any such structures behind. Though some have since tried to explain the pipes as a natural phenomenon, Yang Ji, a research fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, told that the pyramid may have been built by intelligent beings. He did not dismiss the theory that ancient extraterrestrials may be responsible, saying this theory is understandable and worth looking into, but scientific means must be employed to prove whether or not it is true. Another theory is that it was built by prehistoric humans with techniques lost to humans of a latter period. The pipes lead into a salty lake, though a twin lake nearby contains fresh water. The surrounding landscape is strewn with what he describes as strangely shaped stones. Rocks protrude from the ground like broken pillars. Who could have built a pipe system 150,000 years ago. These are iron pipes, not clay or rock. They would have had to have been constructed. No one was smelting iron that long ago, according to our current understanding of history. Is it possible that an ancient race of people lived long before our so-called historical timeline? If so, what other artifacts exist that prove their existence? Spheres found in the mines of South Africa have piqued the curiosity of researchers for decades. Why? Because they're 2.8 billion years old and appear to be man-made. According to Michael Cremo and other researchers of prehistoric culture, 
these spheres add to a body of evidence suggesting intelligent life existed on Earth long before a conventional view of history places it there. Cremo has traveled the world gathering information on out-of-place artifacts. He compiled his findings in the popular book Forbidden Archaeology, The Hidden History of the Human Race. In 1984, while investigating the spheres, he contacted Rolf Marx, curator of the Museum of Klerksdorp, South Africa, where some of the spheres are kept. Marx described the spheres as being about 2.8 billion years old, with a very hard surface and a fibrous structure inside. He found them quite strange and puzzling. Marx wrote, according to Cremo, there is nothing scientific published about the globes, for the facts are they are found in Prophylite, which is mined near the little town of Otsdell in the western Transvaal. Some of the so-called Klerkstrop spheres are elliptical in shape with rough edges around the center. But some are so balanced in shape and proportion, and the grooves around them look so straight and hand-carved, it seems unlikely they were naturally formed. Proponents of this theory say that the spheres were made by intelligent beings. Cremo and others who hold that these spheres are evidence of advanced prehistoric civilizations say mainstream science needs to be bolder and more willing to acknowledge evidence that could contradict dominant views. What was the purpose of the spheres? And who was manufacturing them 2.8 billion years ago? Women today carry a purse. It's part of our modern culture. Men wear backpacks and carry a wallet. We have bags for pretty much everything today. One of the more mysterious symbols that has been found in ancient carvings is an image that looks uncannily like a handbag. The shape appears in depictions made by the Sumerians in Iraq in the ruins of ancient Turkish temples, in decorations of the Moai of New Zealand, and in crafts made by the Olmecs of Central America. Handbags can be seen in the art of various cultures from around the world and throughout time, with the first known instance of a handbag appearing at the end of the Ice Age. What is this mysterious symbol that can be found throughout the ancient world. The handbag image is so called because it looks very similar to the modern day purse. The objects typically feature a rounded handle-like top and a rectangular bottom and may include varying degrees of additional details of texture or pattern. The images sometimes appear as standalone objects Sometimes they are depicted in the hand of a person, a god or mythical being, in a manner similar to how one would hold a basket. One of the earliest instances of the handbag motif can be seen in the ruins of Gobekli Tepe, located at the top of a mountain range in southeast Turkey. Dating back to approximately 11,000 BC, Gobekli Tepe is one of the oldest temple complexes ever discovered. The exact purpose of the mountain sanctuary is unknown. However, it appears that the temple may have served as a site for religious sacrifices. The walls and pillars of the temple were decorated with finely carved animal gods and mythical creatures perhaps in an effort to portray the many different creations of the cosmos. Amidst these other carvings are three handbags. Experts believe that early religions worshipped the fundamental elements of life on Earth. Therefore, the three Gobekli Tepe handbags 
taken as an early form of those icons, could be said to symbolically define the site as a temple. Elsewhere, the handbag image shows up with striking similarities in two stone reliefs, one made by the Assyrians of ancient Iraq, sometime between 880 to 859 BC, and the other made by the Olmecs of ancient Mesoamerica, sometime between 1200 and 400 BC. In both of these images, a man-like figure carries the handbag in his hand, as if it were a basket or purse. When used in Assyrian art, it is said the purse holds magic dust. When depicted in Olmec art, they postulate that it contains herbs for getting high. This suggests that the handbag may have been a standard of measurement uniquely discovered by both cultures. In any case, these handbags appear on statues and reliefs all around the world and are very similar. What were they? What did they contain? And why was it important to depict this symbol in statues and art thousands of years ago? The Stone of the South at Baalbek, Lebanon, is the largest worked monolith on Earth, weighing in at a staggering 1,242 tons. It is even heavier than the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, which weighs an estimated 1,000 tons, that sits on the other side of the road in the quarry. Neither of these stones made it to the main Temple of Jupiter, some 900 meters to the northeast, but some 400 ton and 800 ton stones did make their way to the temple, were raised 20 feet in the air, and were placed with machine-like precision onto the foundations of this mighty ancient complex. Janine Abdel Messiah and her team uncovered a further monolith that sits virtually underneath the stone of the pregnant woman. Until recently, it was buried under a few feet of dirt and has been measured at 19.6 meters long, 6 meters wide, and 5.5 meters thick. Because they've not yet reached the bottom of the rock to completely clear it, they have no idea of the volume or complete dimension of this ancient stone. The outline of it can be seen and shows a kind of precision we find in ancient Peru and Egypt. The discovery of this new monolith just adds another level of mystery to the situation as it sits virtually under the stone of the pregnant woman and would have had to have been lifted out after this other 1,000 ton block was moved. Could Baalbek have been constructed by giants? It certainly appears to have been built by giants when trying to work out how some of these stones could have been moved into place. The western wall of the Temple of Jupiter contains some of these immense blocks that make up the triathlon, at least 20 feet above ground level so how could they have got them from the quarry to the main site, then placed them so accurately? The stones of Baalbek are one of the enduring mysteries of the ages, and it does seem like some special occult power was employed to quarry, lift, and transport these immense blocks. Why they decided to use stones of this size has baffled researchers for generations. It would have been much easier to use smaller blocks and put them together at the site. Perhaps if they were giants, then these stones were not as large to them as they are to us. We may never know how Baalbek was constructed. One thing we do know is that we cannot duplicate this endeavor.
How is it that the Sumerians and Egyptians rose to become empires so quickly? Ancient Egyptian civilization emerged in the fertile Nile Valley, bounded on each side by harsh deserts. In Mesopotamia, now southern Iraq, the land between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, the first cities appeared on irrigated lands. Both resulted from the consolidation of political and economic power. Before 3100 BC, the Nile Valley held a series of competitive kingdoms. After centuries of unsettled conditions, Egypt became a unified river valley state under a leader named Narmer. Sumerian civilization in Mesopotamia was a patchwork of small city-states, each with their own aggressive rulers and patron gods or goddesses. All depended on irrigation, agriculture, and highly centralized government. In the case of Egypt, the pharaoh was supreme ruler, thought to be a living god. In Mesopotamia, city rulers known as Lugals were considered to have divine powers. They were also skilled warriors. Who were these gods and how did they manage to create such awesome empires when man was supposed to be little more than migrant nomads? We know much about modern history because these cultures left stone tablets with writing. Who taught these people to write? how to carve and work with stone, some stones being huge and heavy. Where did they get their knowledge of mathematics and architecture? Modern history marks these two cultures to be the beginning of what we today call civilization. Though there is now emerging more evidence man may have been civilized long ago. The gods who ruled and taught mankind apparently were technologically advanced. Could they have been aliens? Or is our history so fragmented we have no idea how technology really began? This ancient discovery, but very important to modern culture, is the famous Shroud of Turin. The shroud is said to be an ancient cloth that covered the body of Jesus Christ when he ascended from his tomb. The power of his ascension caused an image of his body on the cloth. Determining if the shroud is authentic means following its timeline from the tomb to Italy where it is now. The history of the shroud from the 15th century is well recorded. It's the time backward from then to the death of Jesus that is in question. It is said the shroud was taken to Turkey to heal a king, then made its way to Italy. Connecting these dots of where it was is part of history. The other part is how an image came to be on the shroud. Tests have shown it is not a painting or contains pigments of an impression. Pollens from the cloth seem to tell its origin is indeed from the correct area Jesus was buried. There are several reddish stains on the shroud suggesting blood, but it is uncertain whether these stains were produced at the same time as the image or afterwards. The image on the shroud appears like the negative of a photograph, though photography did not exist in the time of Jesus. The image clearly and accurately depicts the wounds on Christ and blood that flowed from them. Some believe the shroud is a simple forgery, while others point to the blood and other accurate points within the image and the cloth itself dating to the proper age. In 1976, Pete Schumacher, John Jackson, and Eric Jumpner analyzed a photograph of the shroud image using a VP8 image analyzer, which was developed for NASA to create brightness maps of the moon. A brightness map 
interprets differences of brightness within an image as differences of elevation. They found that, unlike any photograph they had analyzed, the shroud image has the property of decoding into a three-dimensional image when the darker parts of the image are interpreted to be those features of the man that they were closest to on the shroud and the lighter areas of the image of those features that were farthest. The researchers could not replicate the effect when they attempted to transfer similar images using techniques of block print engravings, a hot statue, and base relief. The Shroud of Tyran is either an accurate image of Christ on cloth, or it is the cleverest forgery ever constructed by an early man. In May of 2018, Turin's International Center of Sidenology held its annual meeting in Chambéry, France. The primary topic of discussion was a new reevaluation of its carbon dating. Lost civilizations, out of place artifacts, mysterious walls and monuments. Mankind loves a good mystery but these items are also important from a historical point of view. Our history is fragmented and much of it has been lost. We believe in a linear existence from one point in time to another. But perhaps history is not a straight line, but rather comes and goes in a curved manner of life on Earth. Instead of thinking we have one history, perhaps we have had several, with man, or some being like man, evolving up to a point, then being destroyed, and having to start all over again. Is it possible that there have been several civilizations on Earth in its 4.5 billion years of existence? If artifacts and obvious machine technology found in ancient ruins are to be believed, then somewhere back in time, there may have been other timelines and other civilizations before us. If so, which one are we? 4.5 billion years is plenty of time for several civilizations to have emerged, even advanced societies. Some say there have been at least five civilizations on Earth. Perhaps, Rather than looking for aliens outside of our planet to explain these mysteries, we should be looking more towards ourselves and dig deeper to find who we were in epochs long forgotten. <laughs>